have, uh, right now there's eight kids in my house, so I'll try to use my managing eight children voice to see if I can get through the evening. I'll do the best I can. I need to do my luck in the top. We got way into Magus. He didn't see quite a go. Makwa Indo Dam, Gawa Babana Kog, Ish Kanaganing, and Dun Jabab, and which Indo and Manga Tuck and which. That would be Ojibwe. This is language from my community. I know all you guys in there trying to figure out how to write that. Uh, but basically, I greeted you in our language and I said thank you very much for the honor of being here with you. Thank you for coming out. And I told you that I'm from the White Earth Reservation, which is in northwestern Minnesota. You all know where Minnesota is, I assume. <laughs> and I am uh, I'm, uh, from the Bear Clan and the Mississippi Band out there, but that is uh, that's kind of what I said. In any case, that's a little bit about me. I um, when I thought about you know what to talk with you about tonight, I, there's a phrase in Ojibwe, and don't be alarmed that I'll spend the entire evening talking in Ojibwe. I just am someone who believes in multiculturalism and also believes uh, is opposed to. Uh, I think that the, the number of ways we can talk to the creator and express ourselves through our languages is important. I don't like uh, English only. I'm an opponent of English only. Let me put it that way. But having said that, there's a phrase in Ojibwe that kind of crystallizes this issue. That phrase is, Jimis Awabandaming, Jimis Awabandaming, which if you're going to kind of break it down in everyday English today, you come up with something like positive window shopping for your future. See? Positive window shopping for your future. So that is what I want to talk about. The idea of envisioning what you want the future to look like. And going through the process of putting your heart and your mind and your prayers and your hard work towards making that. That is the process of determining your destiny. That is the process which is something that we were given by the Creator the right to determine our destiny, a fundamental human right. But that is really something that I think is a question in today's society. When I would, you know, one of the things I was deeply concerned about is I was afraid I would wake up the year 2000 in my rural northern Minnesota home and look out there in the sky and see the year 2000 brought to you by Nike and Walmart. You know, I myself feel like I would like to bring the future to myself. I do not need it underwritten. I don't need someone else's plan. I want to be part of that process. And so that process is what I want to talk a little bit about. I'm going to talk a little bit about activism. And let me tell you that the work that I do in my own community and the work that we do in our community collectively is motivated by a couple of things. The first thing that I will tell you honestly I'm motivated by is that I'm a parent. I have, uh, I have three children of my own. The youngest is, is two, the oldest is 14. But right now in my household there are eight kids. And uh, anyone who has uh, been raised in a household with a lot of kids knows that that's a great privilege. It is a great uh, responsibility as a parent, but it is also a heck of a lot of laundry, as you may imagine. And so, you know, you try to do the best you can as a parent. If I was to listen to all the advertising on TV, they say that, you know, the average American gets about 13,000 commercials a year. And if I was to take careful notes of those commercials about how to be a good mother, I'd come up with some clear ideas. The first would probably be I should make sure I shop well, make sure that everything comes in in a timely manner on the dinner table and perfect. And the other thing is, of course, that my white should be their whitest and my bright should be their brightest. <laughs> I live on a dirt road, so I had to kind of write that one off. But anyway, having said that, I think that parenting is probably a little more than that. Uh, but in being a mom, you know, I, 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 I start with certain things and I, and I think about them. So I, I think about, like, how to take care of my kids and feed them and make sure that they eat the right thing. So I had to make some rules. The first rule I had to make was that uh, you don't take seven or eight kids shopping. <laughs> you know, you don't take them to the grocery store. That's like madness. And so I, uh, I, I usually live in it one or two. You can go in the store with me. But then you go someplace like the cereal aisle. Maybe, you know, if you've been in the cereal aisle lately, my personal opinion, there are too many choices. You know, why do we need so many kinds of cereal? It's like America is a, is a society of choice, right? You know, I personally would like to have choice about other things than, than how, what kind of toothpaste or what kind of cereal. I'd like to have choice about if I can breathe the, the air or drink the water. That would be like good choices in my mind. Or like what kind of job opportunities there are. That would be good. You know, but we have, we have a lot of choices in the, in the consuming department. So I go down the aisle and I had to make a rule. And the rule that I made is that my kids are only allowed to eat brown breakfast cereal. That was the rule. That is like the rule of sanity. 
You know, I decided that, in, in my, my belief is, is that the creator only intended for us to eat brown breakfast cereal. Fruit Loops and Lucky Charms, not on the list. You know, so you start with that with kids because your kids will, you know, having seen the latest on, on the cereal box, that's what they're going to, right? So we had to go for the brown breakfast cereal plan. So I realized, you know, I look at the brown breakfast cereal box and make sure that there's all the right kinds of, you know, recommended daily allowance, not too much sugar, not too much funky stuff in there. I go through this set of decisions to make some right decisions for my kids, and then I realize the absurdity of the situation. Why should I be more concerned about how much sugar is in my kids' breakfast cereal, and not concerned about how much PCBs, or methylmercury, or arsenic, or lead, or dioxin is in my kids' tissue? How's the reality of the situation here? I mean, this is New York. New York is like the PCB capital of the world, from what I can ascertain. You know, every time I look, they open up something is like some new cache of PCBs they found someplace. You know, between I don't happen to have sperm, as you may have noticed, but between sperm and the stratosphere, they say that there's 80,000 chemicals that are out there, and they are totally imprinted on our bodies. And the more walking around carrying a body burden that is like in excess. I mean, you go to upstate New York, some of these places like on the on the St. Lawrence, and you've got pictures running around that illegally considered toxic waste, PCBs. You know, so high the levels that contaminate coal on the on the um, on the Mohawk Reservation up there, Aquasasi. You know, so why should I not be concerned about those issues and just focus entirely on sugar and breakfast cereal? So that, in my mind, is kind of how I became, became engaged in responsible parenting. Because to me, that is to be a responsible parent. Is that if you're going to be concerned about what your kids are eating, you better be concerned about what your kids are giving. You better be concerned about what they're drinking. You better be concerned about what is in their playground. You want your kids and their descendants to actually have a chance in making it. So that is, in part, what really politicized me, is, is, is just being a parent and just trying to be a responsible adult in this society. I'll tell you honestly that I am also, you know, I also, as an activist, am motivated by considering kind of what I think are basic human values and then the, the total dis, disparate nature of those, you know, how the, those do not seem to appear in American society. I'm going to give you some good examples. Like, for instance, how many of you were taught don't steal? Were all of you taught by your parents don't steal? The rest of you, I'm going to assume, were also taught don't steal. You just didn't raise your hands. But, you know, that is like something you teach your kids, right? Don't steal, right? But you go out there and you look, and, and that is not actually the lesson. Like, take, for example, the situation of my community. I live on an Indian reservation in northwestern Minnesota. An Ojibwe reservation, or Anishinaabe, how we call ourselves. And on that reservation, 90% of the land within our reservation borders is held by non Indians. And the largest landholders are the federal, state, and county governments, all of which got that land illegally. Now, how's that work? You know, the crime that we have is that we happen to have had a neighbor named Frederick Warehouser. Most of you probably don't know because we're a little bit from the east, but Frederick Warehouser was this guy who lived in this town just south of us called Little Falls, Minnesota. He got a, he had a little lumber mill, you know, that's a pretty good deal. It's a really good deal when you get something like that my running mate in 96 and 2000 Ralph Nader would call corporate welfare, which is what I would call it. When you get the federal government to pay for a railroad that goes from your lumber mill to all the fine trees on the Indian <coughs> reservations in northern Minnesota. That's a good deal. You know, that's a very good deal. So that is what happened. You know, in, in the end of that, some get rich and some get poor. He ends up with all the trees and a good portion of the land on all of those reservations in northern Minnesota. We end up with no trees and no land. You know, and that is the foundation of it. So, you know, then the federal government ends up taking even more of the land than the state government. And so you've got a situation on my reservation where, as I said, 90% of the land is controlled by non-Indian interests. A good portion of that, descendants of the Weyerhaeuser era. And then in addition to that, the, the, the government is the largest landholder on the reservation. So if your land was taken from you illegally, physically stolen, why is it that I should tell my kids not to steal, and I should not tell the government not to steal? So that is kind of the quandary I find myself in. Now I teach my kids other things, like how many of you all were taught don't be greedy? Were all of you, how many of you were taught to don't be, not be greedy? You know, I know the rest of you. But you know, that is, okay, we will, yeah, we will. 
we won't ask you a question about that part. Um, you know, I think that that is kind of the basic decency issue. I tell my kids not to be greedy. You know, which I think is a, is a decent teaching. You know, share, be nice, don't be greedy. I mean, I was raised like that. I don't think that that was like an off-the-wall thing to be raised with. So I teach them to do it kids. But you look out here in the society, and that's not what we teach at all. In the society, we teach, go ahead and be greedy. Go ahead and get rich. Who the heck cares? I mean, you know, we don't ask how they got rich. You know, we and by and large assume that if they got rich, they deserved it. They must have worked hard instead of pilfering someone's pension fund or four or what they You know, nothing like that. You know, instead, we, you know, we don't ask questions about it. And in fact, you know, the irony is that we are a society which glamorizes the rich. One of my little pet peeves is, you know, I shouldn't say it's a pet peeve, but it's like, who the heck are Regis and Kelly? You know what I'm talking about? Like, why do we even know about those people? Why have they got the substance in this world? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I don't even know why I know their names. It's like, who cares? You know what I'm saying? There are people who are like, <laughs> Start with what's wrong with Walmart. Go <laughs> figure in 98, 1998, go figure 
And I, you know, I know that some of you have shopped at Walmart. I myself have been seen shopping at Walmart. You know, I must report. Like one time it was like three in the morning. I had kind of a problem. Anyway, you don't want to, you don't want to hear my story about it at Walmart. But anyway, so, so there you are. You know, Walmart, the uh, the gross domestic product of Walmart. In 1990, the Republic of Walmart, if we are to call them that, because you might as well, because their GDP, their gross domestic product in 1998, was larger than the GDP of 100 countries in the world, right? 100 countries in the world. You know, so go figure. That is not like, like you know, we aren't talking like little poor countries in Africa. We're talking countries like Israel. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Republic of Walmart, little countries like Israel, Ireland, Portugal, you know, in that list of the GDP. You know, not bad. So, what I figure is, is that if they're so rich, you know what I think? I think they should pay their associates a decent wage. That's what I figure. You know, that's kind of the question I have is, is that if you're doing so good, why are you paying your workers six bucks an hour? You know, since that's the vast majority of people who are in there. But that is actually the irony of the situation, is that these guys may be rich, but they don't, they don't share. They totally miss that lesson. I like this little book here. I'm going to recommend this book to a lot of you students. This is called Economic Apartheid in America by uh, Chuck Collins. Comes out of Boston, but see, one of the reasons I like it is it has pictures. You see this chart there? I know in the back you cannot necessarily see this chart, but that thing in the middle, <laughs> that thing in the middle, this is CEO, corporate executive pay, as a multiple of average factory worker pay in the United States. Uh, this would be the United States, that one in the middle, right? So in 1980, average CEO pay was 42 times more than the average worker in a U.S. factory. Uh, now you know what it is? Oh, that's right, it's 419 times more than an average worker. Is that normal? No. <laughs> Other countries, like really radical countries like Germany, 22 to 1. You know, and the Germans are not, I mean, I don't want to say it, they aren't like, you know, they aren't like communists, or they aren't, you know what I mean, they're like, you know, they're Germans. The, the Japanese, 16 to 1, right? I mean, that is, you know, in our country, that that is considered acceptable. One of the one of the things that I like the most, I, I graduated from Harvard in uh, 1981, and when I was a student, we had we took over the administration headquarters. I think that that's what some self-respecting college students do. I would never advocate that people do that here, but we did it. I think it's illegal now. I actually have a case about that. So when I was a student in undergraduate at Harvard, we took over the administration building over the issue of the Harvard Corporation's ownership of stock in South Africa. And the issue was that American universities, who are quite wealthy, like I'm sure this one is not going too poorly, had vast amounts of stock and were basically holding up the apartheid government in South Africa. And you know, until 1995, basically you had a country that had legalized slavery. That's what you have in South Africa. And so a lot of the strategies that were used to dismantle apartheid and to go to one man, one mode were a diverse set of tactics. And one of them was this divestment tactic that was at universities. So we took over the administration building. And then I went back to Harvard here a couple of years ago, and I was just proud of those students. They had taken over the administration building again. Now, some of you are too young to have known that. But um, you know, the issue that they took it over took took over the administration building over was the issue of something called a living wage. How many of you heard of this living wage campaign? Yeah, this is a very this is a very decent thing. You know, what they say is, is that a living wage is what it takes to keep a family of four above the poverty level. I think that if you are working, you should be above the poverty level. That's just kind of like my thinking. I think, you know, I think that it's a decent thing to be above the poverty level. And the, and the, the estimate, rough estimate of a living wage in this country, which is what it takes to keep a family for above the poverty level, is about 10 bucks an hour. Uh, minimum wage, federal minimum wage in this country would be about half of that, right? 
And that is where a good portion of the jobs are in this country. And it turned out that the Harvard Corporation, which had made like $55 million in profit, was paying all of its maintenance workers at about minimum wage. So that's what the, what the campaign was, was to, was to just get them to raise the wages to a living wage. So the students took over the administration building. I went to see them. I was so proud of them. I was impressed because they had taken over for like two months or something, right? This living wage campaign. I was very impressed with the students. The other thing that I was impressed with is that they got to order in food. They had like ordered in Chinese and Thai and Indian food. They were, they were having a great time. Um, but anyway, they won. I don't know if any of you know this, but they did win the campaign. And I was really proud of those students for having done that. But I, I tell you that kind of story because uh, students can make a difference. Students can do really amazing things and affect the lives of people who are not even students. You know, people who work there at their universities are people who just ask for dignity. But that question of don't be greedy, I think, is a very American question. It is a question that absolutely must be asked because it actually, you know, we are, after all, the richest country in the world. And uh, no uh, absence of wealth, it's kind of the, the distribution will be part of the challenge. So having said that, you know, perhaps the hardest little rule I have in my house of my eight children right now is the rule, and I know you all heard this one, the rule is you must clean up your old mess before you make a new mess. I bet you all heard that, is that right? That is the prayer of every mother. You know, I, I had kind of wished Sometimes I wish you could just like walk out the door and when the door closed and have like a self-cleaning house. But, you know, I, I, I'm not a big proponent of technology, but I have this like in my head, the same thing that goes on, that'd be good. But anyway, I do not have a self-cleaning house. I have eight children that I must try to marshal to clean up their messes. And, uh, you know, that is a tough one. But you know what? We don't have that rule at all in this society. You must clean up your old mess before you make a new mess. We have the pretty much you keep right on making your mess. And then maybe we will we will have a super fun site and we will clean it up then. Or we have the, the perfect example of that problem is the problem of nuclear power. You know? That is the problem and it is a very New York problem. The problem of you have uh, 109 nuclear power plants in this country, you know, they wanted to have far more, as you know, the Nixon administration had proposed a thousand. You guys all heard of Nixon, right? <laughs> Just thought I'd check. Okay. He was a president. Um, so the uh, Nixon administration wanted a thousand. The reason we don't have a thousand is because people like your parents and your grandparents and me got out and organized and said, really bad way to boil water. You know, a lot better ways to boil water than with a nuclear reaction. Let's, let's do something else. And so we don't have nuclear power plants in every medium-sized city. But you know, there's a good share of them out here in New York. So what, they, what do they say? They say, you keep on making that waste, and then we'll figure out what to do with it. So let's figure this out. 50 years out of the, after the advent of the nuclear industry in this country, which they had like all these smart guys that came in from around the world to help them develop it. They got like 65% of the research and development money in the Department of Energy for like 40 years, went for nuclear power. That's a pretty good deal. They got all these other little special subsidies, plus everybody paid their electric bill for all this time. What did they come up with nuclear waste, for nuclear waste? Oh, that's right. The proposal is to take all the nuclear waste in this country, to put it on trucks and trains, drive it all the way across this country within a half a mile of like 70 million Americans, and go in out and dump it on an Indian reservation. That would be Western Shoshone Territory, Yakima. That is the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. That is the proposal. Now that is, you know, we could say that that is a Native American problem. I don't think that's a Native American problem. I think that that is a public health crisis. Is what that is. You know, I, there's, there's a reason that this bill is known as, or this law is known as Mobile Chernobyl. You know, <laughs> think of it this way each shipment, 90,000 shipments, is what they're talking about. Each shipment, the equivalent of 250 Hiroshima bombs. Going down a highway <laughs> interstate, there's a couple of proposals to barge it across the Great Lakes. Barge it across the Great Lakes. You know, what's going to happen if, like, one of those little casks falls off in one of these small towns on one of these freeways? You know, not impossible. There's certainly been a little bit of, you know, pilot, pilot and driver error in the last while, you know? You know, someone's going to go up there in their little brooms and white suits and sweep it up? You know, this is a huge public health hazard. So what is the solution? You know, there's not an easy solution to this. 
the uh, you know, first part of the solution, I was, I've been trying to get a hold of George W., but he doesn't return my calls. You know, my idea was to teach George W. You know, I went to Harvard, he went to Yale. My vocabulary, I might suggest, is a little broader. <laughs> that would be useful at this time. The word, it's got a lot of syllables, though. The word is decommissioning. Decommissioning. That's a lot of syllables, huh? Decommissioning means it really applies to things like nuclear power plants and dams. Sometimes you just cut your losses, you admit it was a bad idea, and you start taking the thing apart and quit using it. You know, that's the problem with nuclear power at this country. Is, you know, you cannot, you got, the bathtub is flooding. Someone has to turn off the faucet. That would be the start of the solution, is to quit making it if you don't know what the heck to do with it. You know? So that is, that is this problem. You teach your kids not to, you know, not to make a mess or to make a mess to clean it up. And then my 11-year-old, you know, 12-year-old son is, uh, is quite conniving. You know, he hasn't yet told me that he doesn't have to clean up his room because Westinghouse and, you know, Con Ed didn't have to clean up their rooms, but, you know. But, I mean, you know, so you teach your kids one thing, you look up there, you have this totally different thing, you know. So that is kind of the things that drive me mad as a parent, is I try to do the right thing, and then I look out there, and there's this totally major disconnect to what you teach your kids. I'll tell you, I'm also motivated by our teachings as Anishinaabe people. And I'm not going to ask you, uh, you know, I doubt that you all know much about Native people. Um, but I will tell you that Anishinaabe people were in the northern part of five American states and the southern part of four Canadian provinces. There's about 250,000 of us in. And we are uh, not people just in the past. We're people who are obviously alive and vital today. We have about 100 separate reservations and reserves. In our teachings, we hold them as a part of our instructions on how to, to, to look forward. Um, each society has teachings. Each community has spiritual teachings and lessons and uh, you know, one would do well to try to, to figure out what those are. But having said that, in our teachings, um, we had these prophets that came to us and talked about the time ahead and uh, all the things that we were going to go through. And a lot of those things, we, uh, we, we didn't know. We didn't know things like, um, well, we, you know, our prophets talked about that we would botch things up. And uh, I tell you that because no society has a monopoly on botching things up. Every society is perfectly capable of botching things up. The question is if you can fix it. You know, if you've got the humility, if you've got the ability, the commitment to fix it. Because um, we're human. You know, we are far from perfect. Then they talked about some people would come and some would be good and some would not be good. And we had no idea. But that is true. Some people that came to this country were just really remarkable people. Some people who came to this country were not. And it is a really important thing in this time of historical revisionism and kind of revitalized patriotism to not rewrite history and pretend that all of those people who came here were great and all of those founding fathers were great because they were not. You know? It talked about that many of our people would disappear and, and a lot of those people disappeared because of those founding fathers. I mean, there's a guy, you ever heard of Amherst, Massachusetts, Amherst? Named after this guy named Lord Jeffrey Amherst? You know, that guy, Lord Jeffrey Amherst, one of the single largest purveyors of smallpox ridden blankets, wiped out hundreds of thousands of indigenous people in the East Coast with smallpox ridden blankets. You know, and you got towns and colleges and cities and malls and streets named after the guy. You know, we wouldn't, in this day and age, we would not name towns after Eichmann or Hitler. But I'll tell you what, the reality is, is that this country has lots of names that Lots of cities and towns that are named after mass murderers. You know, that is something that, that we do not forget. And that I think is something that this new millennium of America should, should find some redress for, should look for some sort of justice. You know, name towns after Chittington and commit a Sand Creek massacre. Oh, you know? So do not revise things, you know? Our, our prophecies talked about that many of our things would our items would be gone, or our people, and you know, we had no idea that universities would haul off our, our dead, <laughs> or our bodies, or our sacred items. You know? But they did. But then they talked about this time when our people would go and start recovering those things, our songs and our ceremonies, and they talked about that as the time of the sixth fire. And that's what we have done. In the past 20 years, you see the recovery of whether it is the wampum from this area, 
many of our ceremonial items, many of our songs, our practices, those uh, faces that they have in this area. The same thing in our area, different things. We bring them home. We bring them home when we do the right thing with them, what they are intended to do. Then they talked about a new people would be born, the Ashki and Ishnabe, they call them, the new people. This time of the new people, they said, is the time of the seventh fire. And in that time, our people would have two choices in front of us. One path, one mikana, they say, is well-worn, but they said it's scorched. The second path, they said, is not well-worn and it is green. And they said it was our choice as Anishinaabeg people upon which path to embark. And that's what those prophets said to us about a thousand years ago. And they said that that time we are in is that time is now. And I'll tell you that honestly, I do not believe that that prophecy is exclusive to us as Anishinaabeg people. I think that is exactly where we are as an American society. We are a society that has two choices upon which path to embark. One path is well-worn and scorched. The other path is not so well-worn and it is green. And it is our choice upon which path to embark. So having said that, I'm just going to talk a little about organizing and then about some issues and then, then close up here. But, um, I, uh, I work mostly as a community organizer in my reservation in northern Minnesota. Um, I work for an organization called the White Earth Land Recovery Project. And I also work nationally for this organization called Honor the Earth. And I don't know where in your career services or analysis of your choices in the future nonprofit organizations come, but do not write us off. It is one way to engage civically in society to do something. You know, and I encourage all of you, I mean, we spend far more time sitting in front of the TV than we do engaging civically in the society. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons people think that change is, is hard to make, because we've grown accustomed to seeing everything occur within about 48 minutes. You know, go sit down and watch TV, they come up with a problem, they have some complications, and then they solve the problem. You know, and you know what, life is actually not like that. It takes a lot longer to fix things. Um, but, you know, we get used to it. But uh, I work for a nonprofit organization, and um, our organization works on these issues of land, culture, and environment. And I talked a little bit about our land situation, that 90% of our land is held by non-Indian interests. The consequences to our community were devastating. Most of our people were forced off reservation, made refugees in our own land. Today, three quarters of all tribal members live off reservation. And um, you know every social and economic statistic you don't want to have, we have. For our reservation, whether it is, uh, you know, 60% of the people are unemployed, 50% of the people at or below the poverty level, diabetes rates in the adult population over 40, about 40%. Childhood diabetes rates increasing about 70%. Uh, that actually be from what you guys eat, what what people eat in uh, school lunch programs. That may be contributor. I don't think this is a news flash to most of you. Our community is particularly afflicted by it. Um, Arrest rates about seven times that of non-Indians. Um, we have the dubious honor of having the county, the village that I live next to, has the dubious honor of being the village or the county in which we have the highest rate of stolen and burned cars by teenagers in the state of Minnesota. Now, what kind of a statistic is that? Is that like a statistic of functional, a functional community? You know, I'm thinking not. I'm thinking we got kids with nothing to do. I'm thinking we have problems, you know? All those statistics are statistics that are our community. So how do you fix that? You know, where do you start? We uh, looked around our reservation and, uh, you know, we started on the issue of land because uh, all our land was held by others. There are 12 federal investigations that came to our reservation. We have, you know, it's technically called structural poverty. I'm an economist by training, but that's what I would call it, a structural poverty, when you do not control any of the assets of your land, you know? Every tree that is cut on our reservation, someone else benefits from every crop that is produced there. We don't even have ability to produce crops on our reservation, right? You know, all of our lake shore is owned by resorts and camps from someplace else. We don't own those. We don't benefit from lake shore, you know, rentals. It's not benefiting our community. All of those things. You see what I'm saying? This is that's how you stay poor. It's not because we're stupid. It's because we don't control our assets in our community. So how do you fix that? You know, you got to start someplace. We start on the land issue. And we try to get our land returned to us. You know, I'm someone who has exhausted my legal recourse. I went all the way through the courts of the United States to get back our land. 
the courts in Minnesota and nationally ruled that, um, the federal courts ruled that our land had been taken illegally from our reservation, had been taken illegally, but the statute of limitations had expired. We should have filed within seven years of the original time of taking. Well, there you go. You know, so my grandparents who could not read or write English, legally wards of the federal government, having not litigated these cases against the warehouse corporation, basically out of luck. You know, that is the issue of, of justice. It's not that different than the issue of reparations for African Americans. If the crime occurred, does it, is it no, no longer a crime because time has passed? You know, that is a question. We know the impact of us not holding our land. We know. We see it on our, on our kids' faces. We see it in our community. So we went all the way through the courts. The courts basically slapped us in the face. And then, you know, we went to Congress and we got this really bad piece of legislation that was shoved down our throats. And so I've been to Congress. I've been to, to uh, you know, the courts. I had 12 federal investigations come to my reservation. This is my impersonation of a federal official coming to my reservation. <laughs> you know, they come out, they wring their hands, they look at the situation on our reservation, and then they go back to Washington. Doesn't actually qualitatively change our situation, does it? No. So you look around and you figure, well, actually, it doesn't look like anybody's going to fix it for us. Wait for the feds to fix it. Wait for the state to fix it. You think Jesse Ventura is going to fix anything on my reservation? <laughs> Probably not. You know, I don't want to diss him, but you know, it's not. It's you know, he did not. In our case, I actually waited for the tribal government to fix it. Did not fix it. That's a whole lot of can of worms. So we looked around and we said, well, we're the people who live here. We may not be the smartest people. We may not be the richest people, but we're the ones who live here, and so we're going to work on it. So we decided to to try to get back our land. We started with acquiring land. Our two strategies. Willing seller, willing buyer. You guys all hear that? Willing seller, willing buyer. You want to sell, we can buy. Now, too bad I can't get 10 million bucks from the feds as part of what they owe us for taking that land. That'd be a great start, because I could buy $10 million of land just fast on this reservation. It's all for sale. But we buy what we can through individual donations, and we bought 1,500 acres so far. Hold it as a land trust on which we have a large organic farm, a big maple syruping operation, and a bunch of cemeteries that belong to our people. That's what we do. And then we, uh, we seek return of publicly held lands. And that gets back to that don't steal. You know, my position is, is that publicly held lands within Indian reservations should be returned. Federal, state, and county governments should return those lands. If you took it, you should return it. It doesn't involve displacement of a single non-Indian landholder. That's going to take a long time. You know, but one of the prayers I have as I get to lecture a lot of colleges like this is that some of you guys will go to Congress. Maybe even some of you women. Wouldn't that be a miracle? You know? Go to Congress. Go to the Senate. And remember, that's the just thing to do. You know, Native people may not be big and politically powerful and have a lot of money. Well, that was the right thing to do, to return land. Particularly, a lot of these Western reservations, huge land holdings of the federal agencies put all taken. So that is our, our work. Work on land, work on environment. You know, I fight bad projects. I talk a little bit about what's wrong, you know. Big coal-fired power plants, incinerators, dumping stuff that ends up in our lakes, ends up in my kids' tissue. I spent a lot of time testifying at hearings about, you know, opening up new incinerators, opening up new coal-fired power plants, and then we then we talk about the alternative. And I'll tell you one thing: a lot of you are, you know, you're young people. I don't want to say talk is cheap, but you know what? Action is even better. So one of the things that we do is that instead of just saying what is wrong, we also illustrate what is right. So we put up a wind generator on our reservations. First wind generator on our reservation. This is a small 20 kilowatt Jacobs wind turbine. Kind of extended farm size. Now this, uh, you know, the great thing about doing something like that is that now this other person wants one, so they're putting one up. You know, someone gets the idea that it works, and then pretty soon it kind of, you know, it's like everybody wants one. So that's one thing. You know, we could use some bigger turbine, we some more money to put up a bigger turbine. But that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, that's the alternative. 
so I, I tell that to you because uh, a lot of times people say what's wrong and we don't say what's right. The thing is, is, we work on this issue of wild rice. We have some literature here. When, you know, after this, I have some literature on this issue of wild rice. How many of you have ever eaten wild rice? Most of you, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should eat some rice. <laughs> if you're interested in this issue at all, there's some literature that looks like this. Wild rice grows on lakes. Two Indians go out in a canoe. I, I usually knock, and you, and you go like this. It looks like a long drumstick. You pull the rice in, and you go like this, and you knock it into your canoe. Go around the lake. You come off like 200, 300 pounds of rice. You bring it into shore. Call it in some kind of gunny sacks, and then you take it and you lay it out to dry, and then you parch it in a big uh, wood drum. It turns over like this. And then you take it out of that, and uh, in the old times, you know, still some people do. I did it a couple years ago. You dance on that rice with your new moccasins. You get the holes off, right? You know, kind of like that green thing here, right? <laughs> you know, but now you got other machines that'll do that thing too. And then uh, after that, you uh, go and winnow it. You know, when I did that a couple years ago, winnow it with a big basket like this, so you got a fan angle. That's that now. Then you clean it up a little bit more, and then that's where your rice comes from. That's wild rice. That's what you guys want. It tastes like a lake. It doesn't taste like a patty. It doesn't taste like chemicals. It tastes like a lake. Uncle Ben's does not have pure rice. You know, most of the stuff you see today, that's not what you see. So this is a huge issue. A lot of you have heard of the fair trade movement around coffee. It's the same issue. It's around rice. And uh, our community, we always traded this. We use it for our ceremonies, and we also use it for income. You know, in your poor community, that's a big help to market that. So we did that, and then in the, in the uh, University of Minnesota in the 1970s got really smart. They figured out how to domesticate wild rice. They developed these different varieties that were non-shattering, harder shell on them, so that they could grow it in diked rice patties and then drain the patty and harvest it with a combine. That rice doesn't taste the same because the shell is different on it, right? Because to harvest it of a combine, you need something that won't shatter. And then they process it all along, too. So that's what they started doing. They declared it the state grain, and geez, lo and behold, about two years later, what should happen? But the state of California started growing wild rice. And being as they had all of that subsidized water in Northern California and no other variables, California now grows three quarters of all wild rice that's on the market. Diked rice patties in Northern California, an aquatic crop growing in the desert. That would be a little bit of an ecological climate. You know? And we have to compete against them, and we can't. We cannot bring our rice in for the same price. You know, you go try knocking 300 pounds of rice and tell me that it's worth 50 cents a pound or 25 cents a pound. It's a lot of work. You know, and so we have to compete against them, which is totally impossible. And so we've been mad about this for years. We don't think they should be able to call it wild rice. We think that they should have to call it tame rice. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not the same thing. It's, you know, like rice patty, and it's not right. But they don't. They call it wild rice. They misrepresent it on the market, and everybody goes and buys it. So you guys at your food co ops, your food stores, or your gourmet, if you're going to go out and spend five bucks a pound, you better make sure that it's native, it's harvested from a lake. Great with your Thanksgiving meal. It's great all the time, but anyway. That was the beginning of the problem. That problem has now gotten worse, of course. What happened is, is that a couple of years ago, the University of Minnesota completed the map of the genome of wild rice, which is what you do not want to have them do in this day and age. Because when they map the genome, they can monkey with the genome. You know? And that's where you get into this stuff. I mean, I don't know how much you all know about this genetic modified issue. But you know, they you know these tomatoes in the middle of the winter. You know how you eat a tomato in the middle of the winter and it doesn't taste right, it's kind of mealy. Right? In the back row, you guys all know about this tomato problem. So then they figured out that, that in part is because of the transportation, it's too cold for them, right? And so now they have these new tomatoes that they inserted a trout gene in. Because trout are cold resistant. And so those are supposed to be superior. Now that is kind of the tip of the iceberg of GMOs, right? I am not a proponent of GMOs. I just, you know, it's getting a little funky there. And with our rice, we are deeply concerned about the prospect of any genetic modification of rice. You know why? 
First of all, biodiversity is the staff of life. Right now you've got rice that'll come in on lakes or streams and in deep water and shallow water. You always have rice. You know, it's all different. All the rice is different in our area. And so we, had, we didn't have any rice on most of the lakes on our reservation this year, but you went over just a little bit to the east and there was plenty of rice over there. That's what you want, biodiversity. If anything should have taught us that, that would have been the Irish potato farm. So you don't want one crop. Monocropping is dangerous. So they create these strains of rice, and our concern is that they will contaminate our genome and disrupt our biodiversity. And that would be devastating to our community. And that is you know, exactly what has happened with corn. And all it took is just some corn to fall off a truck in Mexico to contaminate the genome, the source of origin of corn in, in southern Mexico. That's all it takes, a duck, a bird. So our community is opposing this. All the tribes in Minnesota and most of the tribes in Canada are now coming on to oppose any genetically modified rice. It's coming in the state of Minnesota or in our area. The other thing we are opposing is that Two years ago, this, this company in Northern California called NorCal Wild Rice received a patent on wild rice. Now, I'm someone who thinks that patents are for things like toasters, you know, gadgets. I don't think patents should be on life. I don't think patents should be on wild rice. And so our community is, is joining with, there's a lot of people on a worldwide basis, like the Indians from India, that are opposing the patenting of, of basmati rice or the neem tree, or quinoa. So we're kind of joining with these farmers everywhere to oppose these patents <coughs> and to oppose the GMOs. So that is uh, what we're doing. If you are interested in that issue, you know, there's some literature on it, but I encourage you in the least to, uh, to um, you know, think about it when you, when, you, when you eat. But having said that, that's kind of what I do. I'm a community organizer. I work on kind of that host of issues. And uh, there's a lot of ways to work on issues. There's no easy answer. Um, in closing, you know, what I would tell you is, is that I think there are broad implications of these issues for our community. You know, I told you the story of my own reservation and kind of grassroots organizing work. But the issues of biodiversity I mean that our reservation is kind of smack dab in the issues of globalization, the issues of who has the right to own life. Who has the right to own seeds in this world? If Monsanto and DuPont, the two largest seed companies in the world, should have rights to patent the seeds. They should have rights which should supersede the rights of our communities. Really issues of ultimately of democracy. So why would someone like me, who's busy in our own, my own little community, why would someone like me, not planning to do all those kids at home, why would someone like me run for vice president? Uh, twice at that. You know? Last time, that's all right. Um, no, you know what I'll tell you is, is that there's you know two reasons. Well, there's a lot of reasons, but the first reason would be that someone like Ralph asked me. A lot of you don't know know that much about Ralph Nader, but when I was little, he was one of my heroes. I have three heroes. One was Spider Man. <laughs> one was Batman and one was Ralph Nader. <laughs> and that's true. You know? The first time I said that, Ralph was standing next to me and I saw him like blush. <laughs> Which was a funny thing. But you know, I was working on this. I was trying to get Ralph to get a little cape. <laughs> a little R on the back. <laughs> I have not been able to, to persuade him thus far to get the cape. The other thing I was thinking from, a lot of you are young enough to know this, is that, you know that movie, uh, Toy Story? You know that guy, uh, what's his name, uh, Woody? The sheriff, right? So I always want to make a little doll like that. Like a Ralph Nader doll like that? What you think? A little gray suit, we could have pulled the back and he could say, end corporate crime. <laughs> he is not going for it, though, I'm going to do that right now. I've tried Ralph on this on a number of occasions. But, um, you know, what's my here? The other thing is that I do agree with what he says is that sometimes uh, private citizens must become public citizens. That's one of his little famous phrases. Sometimes you must get outside of your arena of comfort and do something. Raise your voice. 
put your hand, your heart, your mind, your work towards doing something that will make a difference. Whether that bring in comfort is yourself or your family. You know, sometimes you've got to do that because, because it is required of you as a human to be responsible. I think that those times of critical times requiring critical action remain today. I don't think that there's any diminishment in the need for citizen activism in this society. And there are many ways to engage, you know, civically in this society. The issues that, you know, concern me now are the same issues that probably concern a lot of you. I'll tell you one thing that you may not all be concerned about that I am deeply concerned about, which is energy policy in this country. You know? Whether it is nuclear waste and a dozen of nuclear waste in Kentucky, or the opening up of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. You know, the reality is, is that this country is the largest energy market in the world. And that level of consumption requires constant intervention into other people's countries or territories or ecosystems. That is the reality. You know, we could pretend, but it requires the, the creation of entire foreign policies that are based on assuming and, and securing our level of consumption. Is there a different way for energy security or national security? I certainly think so. You know, so go figure this. This guy, Dick Cheney, gets in office, you know him. You know, I think about Dick Cheney, you know who he reminds me of? And if you guys ever see this movie, The Spy Who Shagged Me? <laughs> you know that guy who goes like this? <laughs> See, a lot of you are young enough to know this, and I am not embarrassed to say that I saw that movie because I have all those kids in my house, you know, so I've seen, I have seen all of the Austin Powers movies. So this guy goes around like this. His name is, is uh, he was, he was, his name is Dr. Eve. He was frozen cryogenically for 30 years. This is right, right? Remember all this, you guys? Frozen cryogenically for like 30 years. He's like the arch nemesis of Austin Powers. And he comes back and he's like out of touch, right? Remember this? He wants to hold the United States ransom for 10 million bucks. And they're like, right. You know, 10 million bucks is like nothing, right? And then he has this other idea, like I'm going to get a laser and aim it at the ozone and create a hole in the ozone. And they're like, right. We already got a hole in the ozone. You know, he comes up with all these really lame and outdated ideas. You know who is that person to me? Dick Cheney. He's exactly like that, you know? The guy comes back frozen cryogenically for 30 years and says, nuclear power, I'll see what we need, you know? I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking Dick Cheney must have been sleeping through Chernobyl. Frozen cryogenically through Three Mile Island. I mean, there's a lot better ways to boil water. It's kind of like cutting butter with a chainsaw for crying out loud. You know, it's the inappropriate use of a technology for an end result. You know what the solution is? I'll give you the best example of what the solution is. Well, cons conservation would be a good start. Conservation is good. You know, cut down the SUVs. I'm, I myself, you know, my new plan on my SUV, I own an SUV, I want you to know, but I live on an Indian reservation in northern Minnesota on a dirt road that you actually have to use it on to get down my driveway, you know, to haul those kids around. You know, you don't need to hear my whole speech on this, but someone was like really horrified to hear that I own. I do not own a Humvee, I own a suburban. You know? And there was someone in my house was like really horrified. I was like, you know what? I'm going for the next thing I'm going to do is there's this, this diesel form that you can use the, uh, you know, this new like French fry oil biodiesel thing? I'm going to get, that's my next plan, is I'm going to get my, my uh, the next one I'm going to have is going to be diesel. And we're going to go, I guess this is two tanks, and you can run your damn SUV off of French fry grease for McDonald's. <laughs> Way to get around, huh? <laughs> you know, that's, like, of course, not the solution to everywhere. There's plenty of French fry grease out there. So. But anyway, the solution, aside from that, would be a big help, is cutting down the use of SUVs. Fuel efficiency would be a really good start. But the, the big solution is this. Consider this. The Great Plains is called the Saudi Arabia of wind power. What do you think of that? The Saudi Arabia of wind power. That means there's a lot of wind power in the Great Plains. And guess who lives on the Great Plains? Well, that's right, farmers and Indians. That's who lives up there. 23 Indian reservations have the equivalent of 350 gigawatts. Did you hear that phrase, gigawatt? That's big. Gigawatts of wind potential. Present US installed electrical capacity, 600 gigawatts. 
You hear that? Over half, 350 gigawatts of present US installed electrical capacity could be garnered from wind energy for the Great Plains. Now that would be the solution in my mind. That would be the key to the solution. Now how are we gonna get there? You know, well, there's a lot of different ways, but I'll tell you that there's this group called Native Energy out of Vermont. We started working with them at Honor the Earth. And Native Energy has this group, you can look them up on the web. And what they're doing is they're working with businesses and a lot of institutions like an institution like this to go and offset their CO2 emissions and use the proceeds of the offset of CO2 emissions to finance wind generators. It's this really miraculous plan that they have worked out. And groups that are doing it, yeah. there's these guys like Ben and Jerry's. You ever heard of Ben and Jerry's, the ice cream company? They're doing it. They have a big, they have a big program in their wind, in their offset in their CO2 emissions and financing wind generators. They also have, I'm, I'm a big supporter of this right now, for your Christmas parties, One Sweet World, that's their ice cream. Did any of you hear this? This ice cream is called One Sweet World. It supports wind generators. So what do you think, Christmas parties, ice cream? That's good, huh? Support wind generators. The other thing is, is that these some of these musicians, like Dave Matthews, you ever hear Dave Matthews? Some of you. <laughs> I am not a big, you know, I don't really know Dave Matthews that well, but the guys did a whole 80 city tour and used his offsetting his carbon emissions to finance wind generators. I was like, I like Dave Matthews. That's a good idea. You know, so what do you want? You want Dick Cheney and nukes, or you want like Dave Matthews and ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> choices up. So, in closing, you know, there are issues that we, uh, you know, as, as people who live here can address. Do not feel that you are unpatriotic to question, you know, where we are going in terms of energy policy and where we are going in terms of military policy. And do not estimate that those two are unrelated. You know, that is the reality. But I refuse to be called unpatriotic because I do not believe in war. budget on the military is excessive. Really? I live in the poorest county in the state of Minnesota and I have kids that go to school in trailers. That is the reality. Do I not think that we could spend some of that money a little better? Health care, health insurance, education. Instead of giving everybody guns on a worldwide scale, you know, giving tractors and medical aid. Move from a foreign policy based on waging war to a foreign policy based on waging peace. And you know what? I think if you do not support terrorism, you shouldn't fund it. I have planned to go. I cannot go as it turns out to this. There's a protest in this place called the School of the Americas. Themselves as the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security. <laughs> but they are still the School of the Americas, and you know what? You know, they are a perfect example of the problem. You know, that and the fact that the United States is the largest purveyor and distributor of military weapons in the world. You know? It's the fact that we train people right here. 60,000 assassins. That's what I would call them terrorists. The death squads in El Salvador and Guatemala, a good portion of the Colombian military, trained at the School of the Assassins, School of the Americas. Our tax dollars. You know, people trained to, to go in and level villages and, you know, and in Mexico, go in and nail a woman's feet to the floor so she could be repeatedly raped by all the soldiers that were trained at SOA. That is terrorism. And we train it and we fund it. Now that is why I do not support our military policy. So I think about that and I think, you know, it is not, it is not un-American and I refuse to be called unpatriotic if I say I do not support that. You know, I do not support a policy waged that causes destruction. How do you make change? The hands of individuals. That is how all change has been made. You know, whether it is women's right to vote, no one gave women the right to vote in this country. This is New York, you guys all know that, right? Women got out and organized is why women have the right to vote in this country. 
workers' rights. You know, my grandmother was in the pocketbook makers' union. That's what she did. International Ladies Garden Workers Union. The reason we have a 40 hour work week is because of women like my grandma. You know, environmental laws in this country, it's not because Westinghouse and GE wanted them. It's because people said we have a right to breathe. We have a right to not have contaminated land and contaminated water. Got out and organized. When will change happen? My friend Tom Gold, who's always have to quote him because I'm not a man, he says, uh, change will happen when the white man in this society realize that the chemicals in the environment are causing their testicles to shrink. That <laughs> 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 money will flow like water to the <laughs> You know, the bad news is, guys, it is true. Chemicals are causing the testicles to shrink. We would like to have change happen before too much of that occurs. Anyway. You know, but you gotta get off your hineys and do it. That's the reality. You know, the hands of individuals. Do I think it's possible? We all seen it. I've seen it in our own little community, a little poor organization, did all that stuff in 10 years. We're not the richest, we're not the smartest, we're just the ones that, that live there. But in the end, you know, that is our privilege. That is what the creator gave us. Jimis of Wabam Dame. Jimis of Wabam Dame. Positive window shopping for your future. The ability, the responsibility, and the gift to determine your destiny. That's what we're given. That's our right, that's our responsibility. You wish. Thank you very much for your time. If uh, there were some questions, or uh, uh, I'm sure that there might be. Yes. Uh, you mentioned wind power. Can you talk a little bit about solar power? Yeah, I can. Um, although I was sleeping on a plane today when I was trying to bring this solar power thing. Not to, not to say that solar power is not interesting, I was tired. Um, there are, you know, vast regions that have immense solar potential. A good portion of even the north has good solar potential. I mean, you see, Minnesota has as much sun as Florida, that's just darn cold. You know, and so. The use of, for instance, um, I mean, household use, to start with, is a key way to diminish our electrical consumption. Panels that rotate that are on your roof, you know, 10 grand, actually, I think even less. You could pay off, pay them off like you pay off your satellite dish or whatever that used to be, you know, and you end up with these panels that'll, uh, you know, provide energy for your, for your own household. I don't know if you have more on that, but there's a, you know, there's a, a, a wide array of work in terms of solar as well. New York is really good, and in one day of sunshine in New York, could supply 365 days of all the same time. And uh, they had incentives in New York that you know, get, we're not about 50% off their and 70% off their business. That's great. Yeah, that's good. It's not happening. You know, the cost of the copper, the battery city, the utilities aren't supporting it. But the incentives are there. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, I mean, I don't want to say, but engage citizen activism to help get those things, you know, that, that resources up. Yes? You were mentioning on how uh, AMAT is a bad there to give money to women. How much does it cost to build one with, uh, one joint generator? It depends on the size. Um, $30,000 is for like a household size or a little bit larger. Some of the prices are going down. The other ones are like $250,000 is what you're talking, you know, and upwards of that. But those are like commercial, commercial generators. They're going to they're gonna put it into the grid. And for instance, the Rosebud Tribe has a 750 kilowatt generator that's coming on right now. And that's the one they received financing through a variety of mechanisms. But the cap financing to start it off is what Ben and Jerry's and Dave Matthews did. And so that just the bridge between what they needed and, and what they had is what they were able to get with that. So, you know, the, the model that they are using is a very good model. And um, there are a bunch of credits that are actually available through the DOE right now in order to leverage that model and to retire. What they're doing is retiring carbon uh, credits so that they aren't sold to another country. I mean, you guys follow me, you know, you know what I'm saying? They just take them off the market. And then there's incentives to do that that enable um, them to help finance it. Thank you for the question. Yes. I heard somewhere that 60% uh, of the oil was used by the military. 
sounds to me like you know we're spending all that abroad to protect the source you don't need. Yeah, I don't know if that's true, but I know that the military is uh, a huge consumer of energy and, and also the largest toxic waste producer in the world. So, you know, if you talk about environmental issues, it would be remiss to not talk about the military. If you um, if you actually find that that statistic is, is true or find any more on that, I would please email me on that. Uh, yeah, but I would not be surprised that the military is in our issues. Yes? What are your opinions about how you you know, I'm not as a, a, a first in it. I know that these new, is this like these new cars, like yeah, the hybrids, the Toyota the hybrid? Cars, boats, the yeah, fuel cell. Those look really cool. Yes. I mean, plug power. Is it called? Plug power. What's it called? Plug power. Oh, really? Yes. Yes, I will. Yeah. I, you know, I was in a couple of those Toyotas, and they're really great. I mean, the whole idea that, like, when you're going downhill, it generates power to how, you know, it's like a very, a very good idea. And, it, yeah, you're right. I mean, I just used the example of the French fry, because I got kind of obsessed on the French fry oil. But you were like, there are a lot of better options than, than just my French fry powered car. Cars like the hybrid power Toyota, do you feel that there should be any sort of government? Did you guys hear what he's saying? Yeah. Back there? Yeah. I actually, I mean, I think it would be the right thing to do. The government certainly subsidizes nukes and coal and all of the bad choices. So the government could subsidize, in some ways, the good alternatives and the renewables to bring them faster onto market. Um, I would support that. Um, nice. Huh? In New York State, we had a lot of tax rate when you purchase these homes to hire cars. Oh, see, now you go. Now you can afford it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they are more expensive. But, you know, I mean, it is a, I absolutely, and they are a, a absolutely uh, key, you know, because the amount of um, energy that we do use in transportation. Yes? Uh, well, a couple things. One, if you guys want to learn more about the advantages uh, once we grow the campaign, uh, you can go to saveourenvironment.org. It's the national campaign. Uh, Tens or like 10 point different environmental organizations like the National Audubon Society and others come together, put out action letters, and get activism on issues. Also, onesweekworld.org is the Manatee site, which is the sponsor for the, uh, end global warming and just measures on that. Um, my one question is when you're campaigning on the road, what was it like to keep the family going, raise the family while you're campaigning? That's a good question. <laughs> you know, as you can imagine, it was immensely challenging. I, um, my infant was born in 2000. And so right now, I mean, from what I can gather, I hold the record as being the only nursing <laughs> vice presidential candidate in history. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I welcome anybody else to, to uh, continue with that. Um, because, you know, obviously it was a challenge, but you know, it's funny because, uh, um, you know, my campaign manager would like, I'd be like, fall asleep in the back of the car, nursing the baby, and he'd be like, come on, come on, wake up, let's go. You know, so you're kind of, you know, doing that, and then you'd come home, and you'd have to manage your, your, your teacher conferences, and, you know, and I know that Dick Cheney doesn't do laundry. You know? And so, I mean, that is one of the challenges, is that common people are discouraged from running for office because of the amount of, you know, the, how we have come to perceive that. And also, I think to a, to a great extent, kind of the amount of, I don't want to say public humiliation, you know, but what it is is like this, you know, this perception that they will look at everything in your life. And, and you know, so I, um, you know, my, my family is, uh, was very supportive and, and, you know, was really good. I took them at different times on, on the campaign. Um, I did not, um, you know, and considering my circumstances, I did not campaign as much as, um, you know, my running me did. Uh, largely because I, you know, I, I had uh, both family responsibilities and community responsibilities at home. And also, like, my child was, you know, liked to be home on occasion. But it was, uh, but, you know, I encourage people to run for office. 
Um, and, you know, obviously tomorrow is uh, a very important day. And in Minnesota, it's a very difficult day because of what happened to Paul Wellstone. You know, who was a, you know, I'm not a Democrat, I'm a Green, but I really, I really loved Paul Wellstone. And, um, you know, it is a hard thing to see, but one thing that I remember, and I remember it from the campaign, is, is that, is that um, you know, politics is about making a difference for people. And we have to reclaim that so that politics is not about making a difference for rich people. You know, it needs to be about, about how we, you know, if you want to recover democracy, that's what, you know, when I was, I was saying that during dinner is, is that my, I went off campaigning when, once in 2000 and my, and my 12 year old daughter said to me, she was then 12, she said, Mom, what are you doing? I said, I'm going off to recover democracy. <laughs> she said, are you going to be gone long? <laughs> You know, we do not recover democracy. We got a lot of work to do. But I really encourage people to engage in that because uh, it will not get better without civic involvement, revitalizing democracy. And, and today, you know, we live in a country which is the richest and most powerful country in the world. And less than half of the people vote. And the impact of decisions made in this country are felt everywhere. You know, and so it is not just about our own, do we feel like, you know, voting, and do we feel like thinking about it? It is, it is a huge responsibility for the rest of the world, right? You know, those issues. So. That's a great question. Yes? I know that you're deeply thinking. Are you at all on by working family parties? Is that New York State Party? That's New York State Party. Absolutely. Well, part of New Party also is the National Party. Yeah. You know, I think that there is a lot of overlap between all of those issues. You know, I, I mean, obviously I'm a green, but to the extent that, you know, the issues that I work on are issues of communities of color that are poor. You know, those are, I think that, that it's a misrepresentation, I mean, I don't want to say it's not a misrepresentation. I think that the issues of the Green Party are also issues uh, that more broadly need to be discussed as also issues of working class families and not just environmental issues, social justice issues. But you know some of the quandaries of a democracy, and we were discussing this um, some at dinner, are the quandaries of remember the new party a few years ago tried to get fusion, where you know more than one can one more than one party could endorse a candidate. So for instance, I could endorse <coughs> Paul Wellstone as a green, and it would be counted as a green vote to ensure that I had major party status as a green party, and the Supreme Court did not support that. Idea. I mean, we have a lot of democratic challenges ahead of us as minor parties. And I am, um, I don't want to call them minor parties because in Minnesota, the lead party is, you know, obviously the governor is an independent. Um, and so we're not a minor party. I mean, you know, but I support a multi party system because I think the diversity of this country is only uh, to be reflected in terms of uh, a multi party system. And I, you know, I want to. I think that people should have the ability to have their voice heard. Besides going out in the street and demonstrating and getting tear gas, you know, we should have a way to have our voice heard, which would be in terms of uh, the electoral process as well. So you got to figure out how to make that. So, yes. Well, I think that there's a multiple set of ways. And first of all, I would not have been, I would not have financed the guy in the first place. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, that's what happens. We are your friends and, you know, I mean, you know, that's what happens when you, you know, fund terrorism. Is you underwrite it and you, you know, the same thing with Saddam Hussein. I mean, who was looking the other way all of this time? Who looked the other way when he used those weapons before? Um, you know, it is just according to what is convenient to us. So having said that, you know, I would say first of all, it's a total revamping. Kind of our foreign policy, military policy is absolutely key. You know, the reality is, is that we would have a lot more friends on the world if we did that, and a lot fewer enemies. Um, you know, anywhere you look, um, you know, that would be a start. You know, you cannot account for someone who is individually like a Saddam Hussein. You know, but there are, Individuals like that on a worldwide scale. How would I uh, post 911? You know, the first thing I would do is I would, you know, if you talk about national security, I would talk about these issues of energy security. You know, I would I would say two things. I mean, you know, and Bill McKibben said some of this is that one, 
is, uh, you know, I would look for some justice, but justice does not mean an, an open-ended war, you know, which is the problem that we have ourselves in now, which is um, just go and keep looking for somebody and, you know, causing havoc. Um, I would not detain, you know, I, I would not, I would not have passed the Patriot Act. You know, I, I value my civil rights, my constitutional rights. And I think freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, all the other rights which are now some, you know, sort of privacy, um, all challenged under the Patriot Act, um, are not commendable acts of a Congress. People die for those rights. In this country, that is what is good about this country, is to have um, some of these basic constitutional rights. Um, I would have said, um, you know, we're going to shore ourselves up, but you know what we're going to do is that we're not going to, we're going to, we're going to make energy security. We're going to go out, we're going to fund farmers and fund Indians and, and do, uh, what you call this over here, the hydrogen thing? You know, we're going to come up with different sources for energy in this country. Um, and um, you know, those are some of the elements of what I would have done. Um, you know, there's not an easy answer. But I, I do not think that, you know, I have to be honest, and I know that some people will take this wrong, is that, um, you know, it is, the United States has made a lot of enemies. And, and so to act as if what occurred to us is totally uh, astonishing. You know, when a good portion of the world um, lives in circumstances that are similar. You know, maybe not the World Trade Center because they don't have, do not have two towers because they never had that infrastructure. But you know, a lot of countries have had, uh, had vast, uh, um, you know, have a landscape that does not look good because of, because of those kinds of actions. I don't know if that was not an easy answer, but yeah. choices prior to abortion. Um, but I am a supporter of choice. If a woman feels that she must have an abortion, you know, it is, it is like that question that you have is that why would you not trust me with a choice, but you would trust me with a child? You know, that is a question I have to ask is that, you know, even prior to that, like, how come we do not have, um, you know, access to adequate birth control for teenagers on our reservation? You know? How come we do not have access to uh, prenatal uh, care? How come we do not have access to uh, quality of life choices for you know men and women in this society that would make those circumstances would, would significantly diminish um, many of the choices that end up being made? I mean, I live in a community that has a huge rate of teenage pregnancy uh, because you know, and one of the major things in our community is, is that we are not. Uh, you know, our community by and large, well, you know, we, we, if you're going to have a baby, then you're going to have a baby. I mean, there's not a lot of abortions that are coming out of the community in which I live. But, you know, it is not to say that a lot of those girls uh, should not have had uh, contraception. They don't even have access to contraception. So I think that there's a lot of ways to, su to support, um, to support alternatives prior to abortion. But I do maintain that I'm I am pro choice. Yeah. Uh, what would what advice would you give, especially to young people, in, in the light of um, people who are making their voices heard and all this information is coming out? Uh, over hundreds of thousands of people just marched in Washington, and the information you just gave about the School of the Americas and all that, to the, to the sense that maybe a lot of people just don't seem to be listening. Where do we go? 
from here. I mean, we're, the voices are being heard, or we're making our voices heard, but there is a sense that no one's listening. Um, what advice would you give? You know, it, it, it seems like a very frustrating time. War seems to be imminent, and people are making their voices heard, but I don't know if people are listening. You know, I, I think you just have to keep up your diligence, and you have to be creative and thoughtful and, you know, I mean, continue, whether it is demonstrating. And, um, you know, we're talking about it during dinner. The idea, even as students, of making sure that you issue press releases. I mean, building our movement capacity. And, and, you know, I don't know the media situation at a local level. You know, I know I'm, I'm far more attuned to the Minnesota media, the media in the rural area, but I know that in our area, we can, um, you know, do, we do get a lot of stories in the paper in our area. Um, in rural areas, um, to try to kind of engage in a dialogue and start and start educating people about those issues. Um, there is no, I mean, I, I keep saying there is no easy answer, but there isn't. You know, there's not one answer either. We need to hold corporate media accountable, and we need to say, like, why did you miss that story? You know, what about that 100,000 protesters? And why was that not in the paper is what I want to know. You know, I think that that is news that is fit to print. And back to that thing of Regis and Kelly, I don't think that's news fit to print. You know? And so we need to demand as, as readers and as viewers that things that are of significance and that people are doing it are covered. And, and to keep pushing that. You know, and of course we're going to be pushing against corporate sponsorship. You know, that is the reality. Um, but... You know, the, the questions of this dialogue, um, you know, the, the perfect example, some of the perfect examples of that were around the last election, the coverage of, of the um, pilfering of ballots and the disenfranchisement of like 50,000 voters in the Florida election by Jeb Bush. That would be a pretty substantive story, particularly since most of those were Democrats and most of them were black, you know? Um, you know, how they got pulled off the voting rolls, how, you know, 8,000, a list of 8,000 felons came in from Texas. You know, that's a nice state to get the list from. You know, that were mismatched, and those people lost their right to vote because their name appeared to be the name of a felon on a Texas list. You know, pretty vague, you know, in terms of, you know, so I guess I'm, I'm just talking about that the problem that you were talking about is kind of epidemic in our society. And the questions of when something is chosen to be reported and how it is spun. I mean, the issues of when the weapons inspect inspectors were kicked out. Oh, actually, we pulled them out now that I recall. I mean, that's like an important, you know, no matter how many times they say the lie, it does not mean it is not a lie. And that is what we have to demand. And we have, but we have to engage as informed citizenry and know these, you know, know these things ourselves. You know, do the research, do the work. You know, be inquisitive, be thoughtful, because we have no absence of access to the resources to do that. You know, this country is, is you know, we are wealthy. We got all the information out there if you want to go try to figure out what's going on. You know, you can still figure those things out. It's just using your head and being committed to using it. So that's how, you know, come on. And on. Yeah, take one more, and then I'm going to be, yes, in the green chair. Yeah, I, uh... I heard you on the radio the other day to say the broadcast of AR was an alternative radio broadcast in your speech in Mexico. And you were listing some of the statistics of the weapons, um, you know, the amount of money for one weapon and how much, how many people would be covered with health care. That's the kind of thing I think that if we educate ourselves and are, are putting that out there kind of constantly to the general public, people will wake up and listen because those are shocking statistics that don't get put out there in the media. So we need to learn them and, and share them with everybody around us all the time because it really doesn't get put out there. And it's shocking. I mean, I think it would, it would uh, electrify the most apathetic person if they really heard these, these facts that are, you know, there to be learned. And I, I wish you would just. Yeah, and a really good website, I mean, Women Against Military Madness, that's what gave me this little card, which I don't have a little card with me, but it's like, you know, you got like one, uh, you know, one missile or 26,000 students getting a school lunch. 
You know, I mean, you know, that's the kind of statistics that you're talking about is that, you know, it's like one new fighter jet or, you know, a million kids getting health care. I mean, it is that kind of a, I mean, that is what we are talking about in this country. We're talking about that we have, we spend half of our money on the military that is encroaching up higher than that. And you've got, you know, kids who don't have school lunches, that don't have health care, don't have health insurance, don't have adequate infrastructure in the schools, don't have enough teachers. You know, those basic issues, and, and 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 the question of how much exactly we need to spend at the top to versus how much we need to spend at the bottom. But sites like the Women Against Military Madness is an excellent site for, and I suppose the War Resisters League would also have some. Listen, I want to thank you all for your time. I think I have a bunch of literature that you are welcome to take with you, and we have a few books in the back. But thank you again, ma'am.